Things are looking bad for Russia right now. Really bad. And China is starting to take notice. It has now been over 14 months since Vladimir Putin first ordered his invasion of Ukraine, a so-called special military operation that he confidently claimed would be over quickly. According to initial Russian military projections, it was originally estimated that the Ukraine campaign would be completed in just two weeks, and that the Ukrainian capital city of Kyiv would be in Russian control within just two days, allowing Russia to walk into the country, eliminate existing Ukrainian leadership, and establish a puppet state to serve Russia in Ukraine's place. These were lofty goals, and if they had been successful, they should have resulted in massive gains of new territory for Russia setting the precedent for even more future territorial gains across Eastern Europe, and resulting in a huge boost to Russian power and the Russian economy, by taking away power and economic resources that may otherwise have been used for the benefit of Russia's enemies. It seemed like a good plan, where the benefits far outweighed the risks, and, as the plan was starting to unfold, Russia's allies seemed pleased with the initial prospects, and they had good reason to feel that way. Had Russia's plan been successful, their massive benefits would have, by extension, also become major benefits to their closest allies. Allies like China, who trade heavily with Russia, and whose own goals are strengthened by campaigns that help to weaken the West. To put it mildly, China was looking forward to a world where Ukraine was under Russian control, and where the West was scrambling to shore up their defenses in a way that may have cleared a more open path for China to accomplish their own territorial gains by invading Taiwan. But 14 months later, it's becoming clear that China is no longer looking at Russia with the same enthusiasm, and there are even rumors that China is now secretly hoping that Russia will lose the war, so that their ally can save themselves from further losses, expense, and embarrassment, and live to fight another day. While this is difficult to prove, and could turn out to be incorrect, there are nevertheless good, logical reasons for China to think this way. For one, it's now clear that Russia's lofty ambitions in Ukraine were idealistic at best. And in a best-case scenario for Russia, it now appears that Vladimir Putin would be lucky if he were able to accomplish less than half of his original geopolitical goals, at well more than twice the original anticipated cost, to vastly understate things. Not just within two days, or even within two weeks, but rather within two years. According to Putin's initial plan, by this point, the Ukraine war should have been long completed, and the world should have moved on and largely forgiven, or at least forgotten, Russia's momentary geopolitical indiscretion, taking their focus back to their daily talk shows and internal political dramas. But instead, Russia is finding themselves in a prolonged conflict, where their army is largely depleted, and the world is looking directly at them and their failures. They have experienced tens of thousands of casualties. Their men are exhausted. Additional people to recruit are running thin, and their resources are quickly vanishing, with rapidly dropping inventories of tanks, trucks, ammo, missiles, and even food. And despite all of this, there is no end in sight. Of course, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised by these lofty ambitions going so far awry. After all, this is a military campaign coming from the nation that envisioned Soviet communism. It's a plan that sounds good on paper when you imagine a utopian future where nothing goes wrong and where basic human behavior isn't fully considered. But then when the plan goes to be implemented and you realize that real people behave differently than utopian best-case scenario strategies say they should, you find that the perfect plan for an idyllic future actually just results in people dying left and right, in a land where grand dreams instead turn into even grander nightmares. This is exactly what Russia has found in Ukraine. They may have entered the war being perceived as the second most powerful military in the world, but now they are stuck at a standstill, and many people now perceive them as merely the second most powerful military in Ukraine. And as the costs of the Ukraine war rise for Russia, and the benefits look less plausible, rather than stepping in to hold up their flailing friend, Russia's allies instead seem increasingly afraid of taking a seat at the table. Case in point, in March 2023, China and Russia held a summit that initially made much of the Western world nervous, thinking that in light of the poor state of the Russian military, this summit might mark the turning point where China finally decided that their involvement was necessary to help their ally. But these fears turned out to be unfounded, as China left the summit promising Russia basically 
nothing. They would not send troops to help the campaign in Ukraine, or even send Russia weapons and ammunition, aside from token amounts of assault weapons and body armor that are hardly enough to change the tide of even a small battle, let alone the entire Ukrainian war. This lousy support from China says a lot more than you might think, because it is a far cry from the support that Ukraine is receiving from NATO, despite the fact that China and Russia announced to the world just before the invasion that their friendship had no limits. In reality, though, this seems to have just been a statement meant to scare the world away from intervening, and the limits of their friendship seem to only be about a thousand assault rifles. To put things into context, and to be fair to Russia, we have spoken a lot about their military failures over the past year, but these failures have not been entirely because of the strength of the Ukrainian military. Rather, Russia's inability to break through the Ukrainian front line has been largely due to the fact that Ukraine has had immense logistical support from nearly the entire Western world as NATO and others have contributed heavily to their cause, providing them with much-needed equipment like modern tanks, self-propelled artillery, air defense systems, anti-ship missiles, basic ammunition, and a whole lot more. But while Ukraine received this massive influx of support to keep their invaders at bay, Russia, for all intents and purposes, was completely on its own. Theoretically, if Russia's allies like China had provided them with a similar level of support that the West provided to Ukraine, Russia should have been able to topple the Ukrainian government easily and achieve its geopolitical goals, despite much heavier resistance than originally anticipated. And since Russia's geopolitical goals also included so much upside for China, it does sort of beg the question, why has China largely ignored Russia's military campaign? And why aren't they doing more to support Russia now that the campaign is teetering on a knife's edge? The answers to these questions are, of course, complicated. But the essence boils down to one simple reality. For China, its relationship with Russia is merely a marriage of convenience, and their commitment to Russia's goals only goes as far as those goals provide a direct benefit to China itself. And unfortunately for Russia, there is little for China to gain by aiding them in their war efforts, and much for China to lose. Let's look at things first from the basic perspective of China and Russia as military allies. A big reason that any large nation allies with another nation is because the combined strength of their military powers serves as a strong deterrent to those who would oppose them. This has been the case since the dawn of civilization. For several years now, Russia and China have been able to get away with many global indiscretions, largely for the reason that their combined powers have meant that those opposing them militarily would need to become involved in a conflict of global scale that could rival even the first two world wars, making opposition too costly to be worth the risk. Together, Russia and China have made for a formidable opponent, even against the United States, as they collectively hold over one-fifth of the world's population, and over one-sixth of the world's entire landmass. China has the world's largest military, and Russia has long been perceived as having the world's second most powerful military. And these two combined forces have long made the world nervous about pushing either nation too far making their alliance extremely beneficial for both sides. But the thing about perceptions is that they are easily broken once real-life tests prove them to be inaccurate. And if Russia has proven anything over the past 14 months, it is that the perceptions of their military strength have been vastly overstated, something which is damaging not just to Russia, but also to all of their allies who count on the perception of Russia's strength to get their enemies to acquiesce to their own geopolitical goals. I've created an entire 20-minute video on why the world now perceives the Russian military as weak, so I won't belabor the point here, other than to say that Russia's abysmal performance in the Ukraine war has moved the calculus of future geopolitical conflicts in a direction that is not favorable to China. For China to continue its trajectory of growth, it needs to continue being perceived as a world power. And in the modern world, being perceived as a world power increasingly requires surrounding yourself with the right powerful allies as much as it requires having real power for yourself. And in a world where Russia is perceived as being much weaker than it was just two years ago, China will need to increase its power exponentially just to make up for the gap. To put it in a simpler way, a weaker Russia means a weaker China. Because of this, China has every reason to desire that Russia end the war quickly, 
and has almost no incentive to join the war on Russia's behalf, unless they could be certain of a victory. But with the force of NATO support already present in Ukraine, victory is not something that China could be certain of. So for China, the best thing they can do is to not support Russia, so that Russia is forced to withdraw its campaign sooner rather than later. Since China relies on the perception of Russia's military strength for its own geopolitical goals, the sooner the world can stop laughing at the weak Russia they actually see on the battlefield, the sooner they can get back to fearing their perception of a strong Russia that has been carefully propped up through nuclear saber-rattling and well-articulated military propaganda. For more on that, check out my other video on Russia's flailing military strength, after you finish this one. There's also another side to this that is a major risk for China. If they enter the war and perform as poorly as Russia has, the entire perception of Sino-Russian military strength will be almost irrevocably broken. And it is that perception of strength, far more than its actual proven reality, that has allowed Russia and China to grow in power and prosperity for several decades. As long as China remains uninvolved in global conflicts, the world can only speculate about what their military power might be, and post-apocalyptic movies likely cause most people's speculations to create an image in their mind of Chinese military strength that is far superior to reality. As long as this is the case, China can keep the world guessing, and continue bullying the world to get what they want out of fear of retaliation. But as soon as that perception is broken, the jig is up, and China can count on losing at least a generation of progress and influence to the West, as the nations around them pick up the pieces. However strong China's military actually is, and it likely is rather strong, the risk of a Chinese military failure occurring at the same time the world's perceptions of Russian military strength have already been broken are far greater than any potential benefits that might be gained for China from Russia winning the Ukraine war with their support. But let's assume this isn't true, and that China is very confident about their military capabilities, and not at all worried about the risk of failure if they were to get involved. This is possible, perhaps even probable, but even in that world, it would not make sense for China to aid Russia for reason of a simple cost-benefit analysis. If you think about it, this equation is rather simple. In order for it to be worth it for China to invest military equipment in the Ukrainian campaign, they need to be able to destroy more Western equipment than they are investing. And because NATO is already supplying generous equipment to Ukraine, China would have to match that investment before Russia could see any strategic gains. More than that, it is likely that any further Chinese investment would simply then be matched by further investments of equally powerful equipment from the other side, which, in this case, has the home field advantage, and much shorter supply lines to the front line. All things being equal, China could expect that the West would end up in a better comparable position than themselves if they were to get involved, even if due to nothing else than greater transportation costs. But there's another factor to this. China, in fact, has no reason to expect that all things would be equal. Throughout the Ukraine war, even when Russia had the advantage of relative surprise while using their own equipment, they have demonstrated their ability to consistently incur heavy losses that far exceed the losses they are able to inflict on Ukraine. And not only does the Russian military incur equipment losses from Ukraine, but it also incurs equipment losses from its own soldiers, who have shown a tendency to loot parts from their own equipment to sell on the Russian black market back home. If they have treated Russian equipment with this level of unprofessionalism, China can only expect things to be worse with their imported equipment. And so, in a best-case scenario, China knows that any equipment it sends to the front line will have to bear losses from both Western missiles and Russian screwdrivers. Speaking of bearing losses from Russian screwdrivers, Russian soldiers have been looting some pretty bizarre and hilarious things in Ukraine, and I made a full-length video covering all of the most ridiculous stuff. In any case, China knows that investing equipment into the conflict would only serve to prolong the campaign at both their and Russia's expense. And we have already explained why a prolonged campaign is an indisputable long-term negative for China, unless the conflict is sure to lead to victory. But let's say that Russia wants to continue the war, regardless of what China does, 
Let's say that, as the famous story of Vladimir Putin goes, Russia feels backed into a corner like a rat, and they are committed to fighting to the bitter end, even if it makes absolutely no sense for them to continue doing so. If they were committed to that cause no matter what, even at the risk of their own self-preservation, wouldn't it be wise for China to submit to the circumstances as they are, and help their ally as much as possible, even if only to squeeze out a meager victory? Well, no. Even in this situation, there is no reason for China to intervene, because, after all, there are the sanctions to consider. While a prolonged conflict is absolutely a negative for China, one positive aspect for them, in the short term, is the sweet trade deals that the conflict unlocks. As long as Russia continues their war with Ukraine, and incurs sanctions from Western nations, they will have no one better to trade with than China. Russia has a plethora of natural resources, and in order to keep their economy running, they have to sell those natural resources to someone. Once again, I have created a full-length video on why this is such a problem for Russia, so I won't belabor the point here. Suffice it to say that, as long as the war continues, and Russia can't sell to the West, China will enjoy largely discounted pricing, and many practical monopolies on strategically important Russian raw goods, including discounts of up to 50% on Russian oil and gas, which they can use to manufacture products at lower prices than ever before, which they then turn around and sell to the West for very healthy profit margins. So, in the short term, China is benefiting from the sanctions against Russia. But if China were to get significantly involved in the Ukraine conflict, the West would almost certainly sanction them just as strictly as they have already sanctioned Russia, and this profitable trade triangle would slow to a grinding halt, because China doesn't buy raw resources to manufacture goods just to hoard them, but rather to sell them. Even if China wants to see the West weakened, they have no desire to break away from the West completely because they need the Western economies to prop up their own economy by buying Chinese manufactured goods. And so, if China did intervene in Ukraine and was sanctioned as a result, both China and Russia would experience the economic repercussions of this trade drying up, with neither having a market for any of their goods. Ultimately, the risk of sanctions means that a Chinese intervention could easily hurt Russia much more than it actually helped them. Because of this, if Russia does make the foolish decision to prolong the Ukraine war indefinitely and destroy their own nation in the process, rather than cutting its losses and going home, China's best solution is still not to aid Russia, but rather to profit from their downfall as much as possible while they can. In this case, China has no good choices, because they do still need the perception of a strong Russian ally to help them achieve their short-term geopolitical goals. But it does seem more likely that they would make the choice that is better for them in the long term, which is to preserve what they have, rather than risking unknown losses to preserve Russia. And this is all influenced by one final consideration that is likely preventing China from getting too deeply involved in this conflict. And that is the risk of escalation. Up to this point, Ukraine has primarily received direct support from NATO, but there are a slew of other nations who have expressed their sentimental support for the Ukrainian cause, without yet getting too deeply involved. Among these nations are those that surround China, including Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Chinese involvement in Ukraine broadens the scope of the conflict, and if that happens, China knows that they cannot just assume that the status quo will stay the same. In other words, if China gets more deeply involved, other nations are likely to get more deeply involved as well, and this is a situation that could quickly spiral out of control into a full-on World War III scenario. And as much as we don't want that to happen, I have to believe that China doesn't want it to happen either. The first two world wars were not planned as world wars. They started as relatively isolated disputes where nations thought they could achieve their geopolitical goals quickly, with minor long-term consequences. World War II started with German blitzkriegs that were meant to be fast and final, and with a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor that was meant to cripple the American Navy in one fell swoop. Neither nation performed these actions with the goal of starting a prolonged conflict. But as we have learned, the best of plans fail when they meet the realities of the battlefield. Both nations failed to fully squash their enemies as intended, and both ended up enduring great destruction rather than great victory as a result. 
The world has since then seen how quickly small conflicts can explode into global disasters in the modern age of geopolitically intertwined nations, as more nations are dragged into the war at every step, and in the end, there are no real winners. And I'd like to believe that the world has become more cautious about repeating those outcomes as a result. It seems unlikely that China would risk world war by providing aid to Russia and Ukraine just so they could accomplish goals that, at this point, provide them with only a minor benefit. And so, in my opinion, it is far more likely that China will abandon Russia than that it will provide them with any meaningful support. But then again, I've been wrong before. Only time will tell the true outcome. But if you enjoyed this video, you'll enjoy my other videos giving detailed analysis of the Russia-Ukraine war, including its disastrous impact on Russia's economy, Russia's military, and Russia's long-term ambitions. Check the videos out, and be sure to like and subscribe.